Hey mates, good morning. It is Saturday, April 3rd, 2021. And right now we're uh, out visiting the Bruckner Nature Center, which is near the uh, town of Troy. And Bruckner is very well known to having a wildlife rehab center as well. And they, of course, have the display of the fellow homies. But what I wanted to show you guys, you guys may have seen it just a moment ago, but uh, there was a mink in here that was moving around, but I think he went to hide. Oh, darn. Regardless, here it kind of tells you a bit about the mink, and that they belong to the Mustelid family, which include the weasels, ferrets, badgers, and otters. So they... They fall within a large family, as it were. And they're very versatile. They can practically hunt in water, land, and even on trees, too. So, moving on. Here we have ourselves the American Crow. These are honestly one of my favorite birds, right here. Hey, fellow homie. How you doing? Hi. Is Stephen King nearby? I think so. Uh, for those of you who have read any of Stephen King's books, or even his films, they really... He always liked crows. Simply because he didn't like it just based on their stereotypical part of horror, but... He admired their intelligence, just like I do. So they're able to basically mimic the sounds of other birds and even humans, too. So they're very, very intelligent. And they fall within the Corvidae family, which also is related to the uh, Blue Jay as well. Like, I don't know if you just heard that just now. But that particular crow was just imitating a morning dove. So they base their learning off of experience. It's quite amazing. Like if you train them enough to make certain sounds, they can actually do them. So in a way, they're kind of like a parrot too. But yeah, they, uh, they're very versatile in terms of their diet. And we have seen it before. Uh, they can fly in flocks called murders. Hey, buddy. Yeah, I'll call him Jake. Because that's based off of the Shawshank Redemption. In which they named the crow Jake. There's the mink. He's out and about. I wanted to actually show you guys. Oh, he's so cute. Yeah, very soft fur so that they can easily uh, streamline when they swim. <laughs> Here we have our famous red-tailed hawk. Common, one of the most common hawks in North America. You can practically find them anywhere. You could see them in even the southern states too, and the western. But they're known to have a very loud call. And usually in most movies, you know, their call is used when it comes to hawks. What's fascinating is movies that have, that have had, like, say, bald eagles, for example, they've, uh, they've used the call of a red-tailed hawk to imitate just because it sounds better. That's Hollywood for you. Yeah, it even says like they can fly very efficiently too for a long period of time without using too much energy. Wow, and they can dive up to 120 miles an hour. That's quite <laughs> impressive. But yeah, that's how they're distinguished too. Is it's in the name? They tend to have a red tail to it. Wow. I think typically too, usually the, I'm trying to refresh myself, 
think usually the females are a little larger, I believe, than the males. Here we have the bald eagle, the symbol of our country. There he is. He's peeking. He's peeking through. Fortunately, these population, their populations throughout Ohio and even this part of the United States, they have fortunately been increasing, as a matter of fact. And you know, for those of you who who know about one of my fellow heroes by the name of Rachel Carson, she uh, she wrote a famous book called The Silent Spring, which really brought the attention of uh, the use of DDT, which is a particular pesticide. Uh, what this pesticide often did was it would cause the eggshells of the babies to essentially break quite easily, too. And thus, it really caused, at one point, their populations to be federally endangered. Here, it actually even tells you a little further about them. I hope you guys are able to read that. So that's what I mean. This is an example. For those creatures who face endangerment, as humans, we are indeed capable of saving a particular species. That's an amazing thing about humans, is that we are able to recuperate. There's a uh, striped skunk. You don't see too many of these. But it's finally... Yeah, they... Here it tells you a bit further. They're nocturnal creatures. Yeah. Makes me think of uh, Pepe Le Pew from Looney Tunes. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. But hey, little homie. <laughs> Yeah, you could literally, as a defense mechanism, their spray, you can smell it from quite far. And it even says they can spray accurately 15 feet away. So what does that tell you? They're pretty good at it, especially since it's a, it's a particular mechanism. <sighs> yeah, Red Fox doesn't look like he's out and about at the moment. Red fox is usually a bit shy. I think, personally, the nature center should name these animals and post them on the walls. Because I think that would add a little more personification, personally. Yeah. Another thing I wanted to bring up, too, before I wrap up this video is... It's finally reaching that time of the year, too, where it's spring. So you're going to see a lot more mating happening. And so this brings up the uh, topic of, you know, how can you tell whether a baby actually needs rehabilitation or needs to just be left alone? So I found a particular uh, useful resource from the Clark County Park District, which is the county where my university is. They have a very useful resource to basically tell you guys what you should do, given certain circumstances. Because, as I said, it is that time of the year where you may stumble upon a particular baby that's by itself. So, make sure that I'll put that in the description. So, alright. Forgive me for the length of the video, uh... I always love seeing the fellow homies and talking about them. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Alright. Enjoy your Saturday, mates. And Journey on a Journey is outwards. Take care, folks.